Hey, Vibe Funnies, didn't see you there. But now that I have you, let's get going with uh, the lesson for today, which is gonna be chapter 9.3, Regulation of Breathing and Respiratory Disorders. So starting off here, how do we actually breathe? I think we all understand what happens. We've talked about the structures, we've talked about the gas exchange, but what actually goes on in the mechanisms behind the movement of breathing? So we have these very special receptors in our body, we call them chemoreceptors, and they do a couple of things. We have two different kinds. We have oxygen chemoreceptors, and we have carbon dioxide or carbonic acid chemoreceptors. The oxygen chemoreceptors are located in our arteries, and the carbon dioxide receptors are located in our medulla oblongata. And they're simply just kind of, um, they're almost like detectors, right? So they're gonna see like, oh, do we have too much oxygen or not enough oxygen? Do we have too much CO2, not enough CO2? So interestingly enough, um, the main receptor is actually our carbon dioxide receptors. So in our medulla oblongata, which is located um, in the back part of our hindbrain. So the chemical receptors will actually detect a change in gas levels and will tell our body to increase a breathing rate due to the change in gas levels, or it might tell our body to decrease a breathing rate because of the change in gas levels. So let's look at an example here. Now, like I said, your chemoreceptors in your um, medulla oblongata, which is this area right about there, that's gonna be your hindbrain, they're your primary receptors. So here's what happens. Um, as the body uses oxygen to break down organic molecules, CO2 levels will rise. Why does CO2 rise? Well, CO2 is a byproduct of cellular respiration. So as CO2 rises, diffuses into the blood, the chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata will detect, hey, there's a high level of CO2. That means our cells need more oxygen. Because of that, we are then going to send a nerve impulse, well, your brain will send a nerve impulse, to your intercostal muscles as well as your diaphragm. They will increase your breathing rate. What happens as you increase breathing? Well, you get more oxygen, you also get rid of the CO2 faster. When you get rid of the CO2 faster, this causes a negative feedback effect where you're getting rid of the CO2, meaning the CO2 concentration in the blood decreases, which would turn off the signal to the medulla oblongata, which would eventually turn off the signal to your intercostal muscles and your diaphragm, reducing your breathing or bringing it back to a normal level. So just to recap here, if CO2 builds up in the blood, chemoreceptors detect this, send signal to your intercostal muscles and diaphragm, increase breathing until CO2 levels drop to a reasonable level, brain sends a, another signal or stops sending the signal to your, to your intercostal muscles and your diaphragm to lower your breathing. Now that's your CO2 chemoreceptors. Your other chemoreceptors, your oxygen chemoreceptors, they're kind of there as a backup. So in situations where you have low oxygen, an example of this would be if you go to a high altitude place. So the higher up you go, the less oxygen there is. So if you're in a high altitude area, your oxygen receptors might kick in saying, oh, we're low on oxygen, let's start increasing the breathing rate. Very similar pathway, very similar pathway to what I've shown you here. Now, I wanna go through some respiratory disorders with you, and I think that'll be it for today's lesson. So the first respiratory disorder I wanna talk about is bronchitis. Bronchitis is simply a narrowing of the air passageways, your bronchioles. We remember the bronchioles, the little branches coming off of the bronchi. So let's look at a normal bronchial here, right? Nice open airway, air can flow in and out, oxygen, CO2 can flow in and out. But when you have an inflamed bronchial, what happens is the lining gets inflamed and you get a buildup of mucus within there. So that mucus lining gets inflamed, it swells up, and then we get this buildup of mucus in your bronchioles, which then leads you to be kind of coughing, have kind of a mucus kind of phlegm-like cough. And it can be caused by a few things, right? Um, it can be caused, right? You might just get bronchitis from getting sick. You might get bronchitis from activities such as smoking, possibly vaping. They're still doing some research into that. So bronchitis is just simply an inflammation of the mucus lining within your bronchial tubules. All right, next up we have 
emphysema what is emphysema so emphysema is a deterioration or a collapse of your alveolar air sacs so here's a healthy alveoli there's a damaged alveoli what happens is as the air sacs get destroyed it's no problem getting air in the difficulty is getting air out and then air becomes trapped within these damaged alveoli and it's hard to push air out um, an example you can do to kind of simulate what it feels like to have emphysema is simply breathe in and out through a straw. So you breathe in through the straw and it's hard to push the air out of the straw. That was, that's what it feels like to have emphysema. It's hard to push air out of your lungs. It's difficult to do. Um, it's often associated with, you guessed it, smoking and chronic bronchitis. So if you have chronic bronchitis or you smoke quite a bit, this can lead to emphysema. Um, next up, we have asthma. This affects quite a few people. There's a few different types of asthma. There can be asthma that's brought on by allergies. There can be asthma brought on by being exposed to certain things, chemicals, pets, things like that. There can be asthma from doing physical activity, um, things like that. What happens is it's just a narrowing, once again, of the bronchi and the bronchioles. And you're gonna get symptoms like a shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing. Um, and what you would do is if you're having a asthma attack, you take an inhaler, which is a special type of medication, which will open up your airways and allow you to breathe a little easier. So asthma can range from moderate asthma where you get a little wheezy and dry grass to pretty severe asthma where your airways will actually close up and you have a very, very tough time breathing. So here's a normal airway. Here's a airway during, say, a regular asthmatic episode. Still some room in there, a little bit of inflammation. And then we see an asthma attack when those airways are really getting constricted, which can be very, very dangerous. Okay, and the last uh, disorder I wanna talk about here is pleurisy. So pleurisy is where the pleura membrane, which is the layer of tissue that lines your inner chest cavity. Um, so it's basically the tissue that surrounds your lungs, this becomes inflamed. And when this becomes inflamed, we get a buildup of fluid between the space between the two layers. So we have that membrane lining your lungs getting inflamed. There's a little bit of fluid buildup. To deal with pleurisy, what you would do is, here's our patient here, and let's say there's our lung and there's that fluid buildup. What you would do is you would insert a catheter and then a collection bag and then have them lean over to try and drain that fluid um, from their lungs to make it a little more comfortable, right? Because if someone has pleurisy and they have this fluid build up and built up in their lungs, it can be very uncomfortable. There's a lot of pressure. It's, it's not very um, nice to have. So that's all I have for you today in terms of the mechanisms of breathing as well as the respiratory disorders. This also brings us to the end of chapter nine. So we've now talked about the muscular system as well as the respiratory system. Moving on, your next lesson is gonna be moving into chapter 10, which is the um, circulatory system. So we're gonna talk about the different type of blood vessels. So take care and we'll chat soon.